What's up? Time Talks Matt here. Let's continue our cranial nerve series. Cranial nerves are 12 pair of nerves that exit the brain and the brainstem. And in this segment, we will talk detailed about the third cranial nerve, which is the oculomotor nerve. And we will do that by first making a quick scheme of the oculomotor pathway to get an overview of it. Then we will cover the very basic of the midbrain anatomy, because this is where the oculomotor nerve originates from. After that, we're going to cover the course of the oculomotor nerve and go detailed into its pathway and which structures the oculomotor nerve goes through. Uh, and while doing so, we will talk through the functions of all the muscles that the oculomotor nerve innervates. And at the end, we will talk a little bit about the clinical relevance around pathologies related with the third cranial nerve pathway. So, the oculomotor nerve is the third cranial nerve and the name itself is a clear indication of the function of the nerve. Oculo means that it's related to the eye. Motor means producing movement. Simply from the name then, it is easy to know that the oculomotor nerve will innervate muscles that move the eye itself or components of the eye. So the oculomotor nerve allows movement of the eye muscles, constriction of the pupils and the uh, position of the upper eyelid. Let's see how. There are two nuclei for the oculomotor nerve that are both located in the midbrain, at the level of the superior colliculi. Those are called the nucleus of the oculomotor nerve and the accessory oculomotor nerve nucleus, which uh, is known as the Edinger-Westphal nucleus. Those two nuclei are going to give a fibers that are going to meet and run together as something called the oculomotor complex which is a combination of somatic and parasympathetic neurons. This complex, the oculomotor nerve, is going to emerge from the midbrain in a sulcus called the oculomotor sulcus, located in the interpeduncular fossa. It penetrates the dura mater to run laterally in the wall of the, of the cavernous sinus. It enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure into a ring called the common tendinous ring and then it splits into the superior branch and an inferior branch. The superior branch will innervate the levator palpebra muscle, which is the upper eyelid muscle, and the superior rectus muscle. The inferior branch will innervate the medial rectus, the inferior rectus, and the inferior oblique. The superior and the inferior branch are the somatomotor fibers of the oculomotor nerve complex, meaning that they innervate the extraocular muscles. The remaining fibers are parasympathetic fibers coming from the edinger westphal nucleus. The parasympathetic fibers will run together with the inferior branch, and from the inferior branch, a nerve will go out towards the ciliary ganglion. The uh, ciliary ganglion is located posterior to the eyeball, and it gives off small ciliary nerves, um, which innervates the ciliary muscles, which uh, change the shape of the lens to focus the eye on near objects. It's called accommodation. And it innervates the sphincter papillae, which uh, constricts the pupil, causes meiosis. All right, so this is the general overview of the oculomotor nerve. Now what we're going to do is start from the beginning, where the oculomotor nerve actually originates from and that is from the midbrain. So let's go through the anatomy of the midbrain again. If you look at this side view of the brain, we can see the spinal cord here, medulla, cerebellum, pons, mesencephalon, and the diencephalon. But if we remove the cerebellum and focus only on the brainstem from the posterior side, as you see here, you will see the mesencephalon, pons, and the medulla. So again, the mesencephalon, which is the midbrain, is what we're interested in now. From the posterior view, we can see the cerebral pedicles as well as the tectal plate. The tectal plate consists of the uh, superior colliculi involved in incorporating environmental stimuli and coordinating the gaze shifts uh, involved in eye and head movements. We can see the brachium of the superior colliculus, which is a connection arm between the superior colliculus and the lateral geniculate body. And we got the inferior colliculi, which uh, take in sound information and send them further up to the medial geniculate bodies through the brachium of the inferior colliculi. From the anterior perspective of the midbrain, we can see the cerebral pedicles, and between them, 
we can see the interpeduncular fossa. Within this region, we can find the posterior perforated substance, and we can see the oculomotor sulcus of the mesencephalon. From here, that is where our oculomotor nerve will go out from. So the oculomotor nerve goes out from the anterior side of the midbrain, from a sulcus called the sulcus of the oculomotor nerve. All right, so that was the external view. Now what I want to do is take this model and cut it right about here at the level of the superior colliculi. Then we're going to remove the upper part and look at it from this perspective. We will see this. Here we can see the superior colliculi, the cerebral peduncles, the interpeduncular space, and the aqueduct of the midbrain, which connects the fourth ventricle to the third ventricle. Now, within the midbrain, we can find the substantia nigra, we can find the superior colliculi, we can see the periaqueductal gray matter, the retinacular formation, the red nuclei, which takes impulses from the brain and the cerebellum and gives off the rubrospinal tract for muscle movement coordination. At this level, we can also find the nucleus of the oculomotor nerve, which is what we're interested in, because this is where the oculomotor nerve starts. The oculomotor nerve will travel towards the anterior side and leave through the sulcus of the oculomotor nerve on the anterior side of the midbrain. The oculomotor nerve is a nerve that consists of somatic fibers and preganglionic parasympathetic fibers. The somatic fibers are fibers you can see here coming from the nucleus of the oculomotor nerve, which uh, supplies the extrinsic muscles of the eyeball. It's uh, somatic, so it moves skeletal muscles voluntarily. The parasympathetic portion of the oculomotor nerve comes from the accessory nucleus of the oculomotor nerve, which is also called the edinger westphal nucleus. They give off parasympathetic fibers that go together with the oculomotor nerve, forming the oculomotor nerve complex. Now, here we can see the oculomotor nerve leaving the anterior brainstem, the anterior midbrain, right? When it leaves the anterior surface of the midbrain, the oculomotor nerve is then going to penetrate the dura mater and run through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Now, what do I mean by that? That it runs through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus is a part of the dural sinuses, right? Carrying venous blood. But there are several structures that pass through the cavernous sinus to enter the orbit. And they're usually subclassified by whether they travel uh, through the sinus itself or through its lateral wall. And so the oculomotor nerve is one of the other structures that travel through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. After the nerve leaves the cavernous sinus, it enters the orbital cavity through the superior orbital fissure, uh, as well as within a fibrous ring called the common tendinous ring. Now, if we zoom in, you can see that once the oculomotor nerve has entered the orbital cavity, it splits into two divisions, right? So let's go ahead and look at this model from an anterior perspective. So here we can see the orbital cavity, right? Imagine for a second that the eyeball is right here. Around the eyeball, there's going to be muscles we call extraocular muscles. And there are seven extraocular muscles in total. There are a total of four rectus muscles, two oblique muscles, and the standalone levator palpebra superioris. The four rectus muscles are the medial rectus, lateral rectus, superior rectus, and the inferior rectus. The oblique muscles are the superior and the inferior obliques. The rectus and the oblique muscles are all involved in the different gaze positions of the eyeball. The levator palpebra superioris is primarily responsible for the eyelid elevation. Now, as the oculomotor nerve goes past the common tendinous ring, and enters the orbital cavity, it's going to divide into two branches, a superior branch and an inferior branch. The superior branch innervates the superior rectus and the levator palpebra superioris. The inferior branch innervates the inferior and the medial rectus and the inferior oblique, as well as a parasympathetic branch to make the lens globular for close vision. All right, let's do that one more time just a little bit more detailed. So here again, we see the superior rectus, medial rectus, inferior rectus, 
we can see the superior oblique, inferior oblique, and we see the levator palpebra superiors. Now, the oculomotor nerve is going to go like this. Then the superior branch passes medially uh, uh, over the optic nerve, and then it supplies the superior rectus and the levator palpebra superioris. Superior rectus elevates the eye, causing the cornea to move superiorly, while the levator palpebra superioris raises the upper eyelid and uh, maintains the upper eyelid position. The inferior branch of the oculomotor nerve is larger than the superior branch, and it divides into three branches. One passes beneath the optic nerve to the medial rectus, another to the inferior rectus, and the third and the longest run forward uh, to the inferior oblique. The medial rectus is an adductor muscle. It works together with the lateral rectus to allow the eyes to move from side to side. The inferior rectus depresses the eye, causing the cornea and the pupil to move inferiorly. The inferior oblique is interesting. The inferior oblique is actually coming from the medial side or the nasal side and coming underneath the eyeball and attaches to the inferior lateral portion of the eyeball. And then when it contracts, it does something really interesting. It pulls from that portion and it pulls upwards. And when it pulls, it pulls the eyeball upwards and rotates it outwards. So it elevates the eyeball and it rotates the eyeball laterally. So it does what's called superior and lateral rotation. The superior oblique, we will talk about it with the trochlear nerve. A nice little acronym someone once told me uh, was like this. LR6, SO4 and ATR3. LR6 means lateral rectus, the sixth cranial nerve. Superior oblique, fourth cranial nerve. And all the rest, third cranial nerve. Okay, so that's that view. So the third cranial nerve has a superior branch and an inferior branch. Now, together with the inferior branch, there's going to be parasympathetic fibers coming from the edinger westphal nuclei in the midbrain at the level of the superior colliculus. Those fibers are called preganglionic parasympathetic fibers. They're preganglionic, so they go to a ganglia. What is a ganglia? A ganglia is a group of cell bodies located within the peripheral nervous system. So those cell bodies there are postganglionic parasympathetic motor neurons. From here, they're going to go out as postganglionic fibers within uh, nerves called short ciliary nerves. And they're going to supply the iris, specifically the sphincter pupillae, and cause the pupil to constrict. So it causes pupillary constriction. And they're going to supply the ciliaris muscle uh, and causes the ciliaris muscle to contract, which alters the shape of the lens, particularly making the lens globular. And when you make the lens globular, that's actually going to be for near vision, for close vision. It's called accommodation reflex. All right, so that's this. Something else that I want to talk about with respect to the actual pathway of the oculomotor nerve is throughout its course, all the way from the nuclei of the midbrain, to the actual cavity, it do have a number of vulnerable points. If there's a stroke or bleeding within the midbrain itself, that can cause damage to the oculomotor nuclei, causing oculomotor nerve defect. If there's an increased pressure within the cavernous sinus, that can cause compression of the oculomotor nerve, damaging it. Another thing that can happen is an aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery up there can compress the oculomotor nerve as well. And you know, if there's meningitis or perinasal sinus infection, that can lead to the infection spreading over the oculomotor nerve, giving oculomotor nerve infections. Trauma to the orbit or the superior orbital fissure can cause compression of these nerves, damaging it too. Or an uncontrolled diabetes or chronic hypertension can cause damage to the blood vessels around the oculomotor nerve as well. So how would that manifest? How would we see if a person has an oculomotor nerve palsy? Let's see. Superior rectus and inferior oblique elevates the eyeball. Medial rectus causes medial rotation, as well as superior rectus and inferior rectus causes uh, a little bit of medial rotation as well. Even though the inferior rectus causes primarily the eye to rotate downwards, it do help with medial rotation to a certain extent. Now, 
If I can't bring my eyeball upwards, where does it go? Downwards. If I can't bring my eyeball medially, it's gonna go outwards. So, let's look at this video for a second. This is a person undergoing a neurological examination and notice how the left eye is stuck laterally and inferiorly because the oculomotor nerve is damaged. He's not able to elevate nor medially rotate the eyeball anymore because the medial, inferior and the superior rectus are damaged as well as the inferior oblique. But the lateral movement and the inferior movement are spared because the lateral rectus is innervated by the sixth cranial nerve, uh, the abducent nerve, and the superior oblique is innervated by the fourth cranial nerve, the trochlear nerve. When the two eyes are not able to coordinate the movement, what happens? You get double vision. Notice also how the left eyelid is not as elevated as the right eyelid. It's called ptosis, this condition. Ptosis also happens with the oculomotor nerve damage, since the levator palpebra superioris is not functioning anymore. So we get down and outward gaze, as well as ptosis with the oculomotor nerve damage. What else do we get? Remember, the parasympathetic response constricts the pupil. If it can't constrict the pupil, what happens? It dilates. So their pupils are going to be fixed and dilated, and it may not constrict in response to light anymore. The pupil is often affected when the cause is compression of the third cranial nerve. But when the pupil is not affected, the cause is often inadequate blood flow to the nerve seen in microangiopathies, uh, often in diabetes or hypertension. And this is because the, when the vasa nervosum is affected, it causes ischemia to the central part of the nerve, which is somatomotor involvement only, while the peripheral part of the nerve is autonomic fibers. Alright, let's recap once again. The oculomotor nerve starts with two nuclei located in the midbrain at the level of the superior colliculus. Those are called the nucleus of the oculomotor nerve and the accessory oculomotor nucleus, which is known as edinger westphal nucleus. Those two nuclei are going to give off fibers that are going to meet and run together as something called the oculomotor complex, which is a combination of somatic and parasympathetic neurons. This complex, the oculomotor nerve, is going to emerge from the midbrain in a sulcus called the oculomotor sulcus, located in the interpedicular fossa. It penetrates the dura mater to run laterally in the wall of the cavernous sinus. It then goes through the superior orbital fissure into a ring called the common tendons ring. And then it enters the orbital cavity and splits into the superior branch and an inferior branch. The superior branch will innervate the levator palpebra muscles, which is the uh, upper eyelid muscle, and the superior rectus muscle. The inferior branch will innervate the medial rectus, inferior rectus, and the inferior oblique. The parasympathetic fibers coming from the accessory oculomotor nucleus run together with the inferior branch. From the inferior branch, a nerve will go out towards the ciliary ganglion. The ciliary ganglion is located posterior to the eyeball and it gives off small ciliary nerves which innervates the ciliaris muscle and causes the ciliaris muscle to contract, which alters the shape of the lens, particularly making it globular, to focus the eye on near objects. It's called accommodation. And it innervates the sphincter pupillae, which constricts the pupil, causes meiosis. So that was everything I had for the third cranial nerve. The next video is going to be about the fourth cranial nerve, which is the trochlear nerve. Alright guys, that pretty much covers the oculomotor nerve. Thank you so much for watching another one of my videos. If you enjoyed, learn something from it, please remember to like, comment your favorite moment, subscribe, turn on those notifications. If you're looking for other ways to support, go ahead and check the link in the description box. Have fun y'all. Peace.